Hello everyone, my name is Bolton Bailey and I'm here recording this talk for the um, asynchronous track session of the uh, Lean Together 2024 conference. Uh, so I'm going to talk here about my work with my advisor Andrew on formalization of SNARKs. So uh, just to start off, I'll give a quick intro to what SNARKs are and why they might be of interest to the, the formalization community. And I'll do this in the form of a a small short story. Um, so let's say that there's an agency out there that wants to fund the creation of a formal proof for the famous uh, TAMREF's first theorem. I'm sure all of you have heard of that theorem. Um, and it's going to put out a, a million doubloons worth of bounty for a solution for the first person who can create that formal proof. Now we have a mathematician friend named Blevin who is going to spend five years formalizing the result. Blevin is a expert in TAMREF theory and so uh, he's really the, the the top of the list when it comes to, to proving this theorem. Uh, and he's going to want to submit that at the end of the five years to the agency for review so that he can get his reward. Uh, but oh no, there's actually a rival of Blevin who intercepts the proof and is going to now pass it off as their own. And the unfortunate thing here is the agency doesn't know who wrote the proof initially, uh, and Blevin, Blevin is going to be robbed of all the credit for, for creating the proof. Uh, what a tragedy. Um, so the, the question that this talk sort of addresses is a way that this unfortunate scenario can be prevented with a form of cryptography called a snark. So what is a snark? Um, a snark is something that, that cryptographically verifies a computation. So we have a prover, in this case Blevin, uh, and Blevin has access to this program or circuit, which you could think of as maybe the lean kernel, right? This is the thing that's going to check a formal proof. Um, and Blevin also has all the private inputs uh, that he's developed by creating this formal proof of Tamref's first theorem. Uh, Blevin can evaluate the circuit and basically guarantee by evaluating the circuit that the, the proof is valid. Uh, and then what Blevin wants to be able to do is produce this proof pi that he can send to the, to the, uh, to the agency that's put out this bounty. The verifier also has access to the, to the program that verifies proofs of, of Tamref's first theorem. Um, and they're going to receive this pi, and then they're going to want to check it, and they're going to want to be convinced that because the proof exists, um, Blevin has actually created this, this proof. Uh, and the nice thing about a snark, uh, and really why it's sort of great for this application, is that a snark is, is a cryptographic scheme which allows this proof pi to only be constant size. So no matter how big the proof of Tamref's first theorem is, um, the proof is only going to be constant size, and it's not actually going to re reveal much or any information about the proof itself. And so uh, just having the proof doesn't, uh, just having the, uh, the snark proof doesn't allow you to recreate the, the proof itself, and so you can't actually prove just using the snark uh, proof itself that you have the, the, actual, um, the actual formal proof. And so what Blevin can do now is attach a, a digital signature or something like this uh, to, the, to the proof as well. And this sort of guarantees that Blevin actually, uh, actually has produced the proof himself. So the critical properties of a snark um, are the completeness Cryptographically speaking, the critical properties are the completeness. It should always be possible for the prover to create a proof when one exists. Um, another property is zero knowledge, which is that the private inputs stay private if, if they're supposed to. Um, and the real kicker of a property is the soundness property. It shouldn't be possible for a prover to, to trick a verifier into thinking a proof exists when none, no proof actually exists. Um, and soundness is really the hardest part to, to prove, and it's the part where maybe the most mistakes are made, um, basically because soundness often involves a lot of complicated mathematical justification in terms of the, the actual development of a crypt cryptographic protocol. Most of the, the space of that paper that's dedicated to proving that the scheme is correct is going to be proving that the soundness is correct. Um, it's something where errors have been found before. So for example, the BCTV14 snark that was used by the Zcash cryptocurrency, there was an error found, and there was a potential 
maybe for, for money to be stolen until this, this error was fixed. Um, and another sort of hard part about this is it's not a space of software development where fuzz testing really helps because you have a whole space of, of adversarial attacks out there that could potentially um, compromise your snark. And so just sort of guessing a few random inputs is not going to not going to reveal necessarily what the holes are. And so this is really what makes snarks a great target for a formal security proof. And also, you know, based on the story that I just told, maybe it makes a little bit of sense to just put different kinds of computational proofs together, right? We have formal proofs, we have cryptographic snarks, which is another kind of proof. It just sort of makes sense that these two things can maybe feed off of each other. Um, and so now what I'll discuss is uh, my work and my advisor's work on automatically proving soundness for linear PCP snarks, which is one of the sort of most efficient kinds of snarks uh, currently in existence. Um, so what is a linear PCP snark? Um, I'll go over in this talk, I won't talk about really the low, low level details of how the cryptographic primitives that support linear PCP snarks are implemented. I'm just going to give a high level overview. So how are linear PCP snarks implemented? They're implemented with something called a bilinear pairing for some cryptographic groups. And what this means is that uh, all of the messages that are sent between the prover and the verifier and other parties in this protocol, uh, they're just going to be elements of a particular finite field, but they can be encrypted in a certain way such that only certain operations can be done with them. So what we have are three groups labeled 1, 2, and T, this third group, T, the target group. Um, and those represent three ways of encrypting these field elements. And the rules are that if you have any two elements from the same group, then you can add them or do, do constant multiplications to them. Um, and you can also do multiplications of an element of group 1 and an element of group 2. So if you have an element from each of the first two groups, you can multiply them, and what you end up is what you end up with is an element of the third group. Um, so you have all of these capabilities, but these are really the only operations you can do. Basically, the, the cryptographic model, which is called the algebraic group model, is, is basically to say that there's no real way for you to do any other operation other than you know, adding two things from the same group, multiplying a constant to, to one element, or you know, multiplying two constants from the, from the first two groups and getting something from the third group. Um, and so how does the soundness proof for a snark like this work? The idea basically is that there will be some sort of setup which produces this structured reference string. Um, and that consists of some encrypted field elements, usually is generated by a third party who's neither the prover nor the verifier, but it's someone who, who they both trust. Um, and the idea is that any group one or two element that the prover produces is going to have to be, by virtue of the limitations on what we know how to do with these cryptographic groups, it's going to have to be a linear combination of the SRS elements that were provided for that group. Um, and moreover, the prover is going to have to know really what the coefficients were for that linear combination. And so what we'll do is we'll arrange the snark so that if the verification is successful, it's going to have to be the case that a valid witness was somehow encoded in the coefficients that the, the prover had to know. And the logic is that if we provide code that is able to extract that, that quote unquote witness out and show that the snark verification succeeding implies that the extracted witness is valid, then that means that the snark must be sound because the prover must know the witness. And if we can prove that the witness that the prover knows is a val valid witness, that means that that's a, that's a valid proof that we, that we created there. Um, and so the last question is, how do we automate a formal soundness proof? Basically, the consequence of all of the observations from the previous um, slides is that what we're going to have is a collection of multivariable polynomial equalities over the SRS elements. Um, and because, so we'll have all of these elements, we'll have all these um, equations of polynomials over these elements. And we're going to want to prove another po multivariable polynomial equality. And the point is that you know, this, um, this basic basically is, is an instance of a class of problems 
that can be solved with, with Grubner basis methods. And there's actually a tactic in Lean called Polyrith, which is, which is able to do this. Um, and so basically what our approach has been is to use some heuristics to simplify the, the set of polynomial equalities that we get um, to make a really sort of small instance of a Grubner basis method problem um, that can then be dispatched by Polyrith. And the, the, the big upshot of our work is that we've shown that this basically works successfully for a variety of popular linear PCP snark schemes. Um, so now I'll just walk through basically um, how, the, how the proof goes for an extremely simple snark. Um, this snark isn't even actually a complete snark, but hopefully it'll be useful to demonstrate how the automated proof works. Um, the, what, what we have here is a prover that has access to these uh, unencrypted uh, field elements A and B. The prover has access to them, in, and, and the prover also has access, along with the verifier, to these additional witness elements, or sorry, these additional sort of statement elements C, D, and E. Um, and what they want to do is they want to make a snark that proves this sort of uh, like one of these two equalities, either A times D equals E or B times C equals E. Um, and so the way that the snark scheme works is we have these four structured reference string elements. We have these two random field elements, alpha and beta, and, and everyone's going to have access to those elements in the first and second of the, of the groups. What the prover will do is compute a times alpha plus b times beta, and that will be that single uh, package will be the proof that the prover sends to the verifier. What the verifier will then do is compute this c, al c alpha plus d beta. Um, they're then going to use the multiplication capability to multiply this uh, the proof with the thing they compute, and then they're going to check that against e times alpha beta, um, which they'll which they'll be able to produce themselves. And so the point is that in order to show soundness, we have to prove that this equality here, which is the equality that the, that the verifier checks, um, proves this desired fact, namely that a times d equals e or b times c equals e. Um, so just to go through how the proof basically works um, in a sort of more lean-like notation, um, the first thing that we do is we sort of load all of our assumptions and goals uh, into lean. Um, so we have basically a prime and b prime, which are these supposed coefficients that are supposed to be equal to a and b. The adversary can generate them however they want. Um, but the, the equation that we have is that a prime times alpha plus b prime times beta is going to, and that then multiplied with c times alpha plus d times beta is going to be equal to e times alpha times beta. And from that, we want to prove this goal, which is that the equation is true for a prime and, and b prime, whatever a prime and b prime the, the adversary used. So the first thing we do is to put the polynomial basically into a normal form so that each monomial is a distinct term. So this is done by you know, just distributing out. Uh, what we get is that a, times, a prime times c uh, is the sort of a squared coefficient, and then a prime times d plus b prime times c is the a b is the alpha beta coefficient, and then b prime times d is the beta squared coefficient, and then over here on the right hand side we have the same thing. Um, the next thing we, that we want to do is observe that once we have our monomials separated like this, we use the fact that two polynomials are equal if and only if each of their coefficients. Um, for, co for corresponding terms are equal. And so what we have as our, as our statement is that a prime times c times alpha squared is the, is the alpha squared term here on the left-hand side, and the alpha squared term on the right-hand side is 0. So that, that allows us to conclude that alpha prime times c is equal to 0. And similar logic allows us to conclude that alpha prime times d plus, uh, sorry, that a prime times d plus b prime times c is equal to e and also that b prime times d is equal to 0. Um, and so then our goal is, is still the same, but now we have assumptions that you know, there are uh, equations in the field elements that we already have, and we would now are, are sort of much closer to solving the goal. How can we do this? Um, basically, our strategy now is going to be to recursively case um, on these sort of zero divisors and simplify out. So one observation that we can make is that in any integral domain, 
a times c equal zero implies that either a equals zero or c equals zero. So we can sort of split that up here. Um, and we can do a similar thing with b prime and d prime, b prime and d, sorry. Uh, and then once we've done that, we can split up into cases, right? Um, so in the first case, we have a prime equals zero. In the second case, we have c equals zero. Um, and basically, what we can do once we have that is any instance of, of a prime, we can just replace with zero here. Um, because if a prime is equal to zero, we can just sort of remove a prime from the equation entirely. And so once we do that, we get much simpler expressions. And we see now that we have b prime times c equals e, and we have a prime times d equals e. No matter which case we're in, we are able to prove the goal. Um, and so a few final comments. Even though that the snark that we proved here is a very simple snark, the steps that we applied are actually much more general, and they apply to much more complicated snarks. Really, essentially any uh, linear PCP-based snark um, can be proved sound using this strategy. Um, and the, the very nice thing is that beyond just individual snarks, this also applies to sort of snark schemes. So what you will often see in the literature are protocols that are designed to produce snarks that work for circuits of arbitrary size. And even though the snark, th th those circuits can be very big, the structure makes them simpler than their size would indicate. And so one of the, the basically the, the difference that you would see um, in, this, in this proof is that instead of these individual letters representing variables, you would have sums over variables. Um, and and even though you would have you would have sums over variables, the, the fact of the matter is because of the way that the snarks are constructed, those sums would always appear in the exact same way throughout the throughout the proof. And so you can basically treat those sums as atoms and, and do the exact same logic. Um, so thanks everyone for listening to the talk here.